Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's an honor to be here at the Calvary First Nigerian Church. I'm a big fan of Nigeria. I spent some time there, believe it or not. Also, my family ancestry points to Nigeria as being the land from which they were stolen. Uh, of all the places I've been to Africa, and I enjoy everywhere I go, Ethiopia, South Africa, Liberia, Senegal, Malawi, but it's something about Nigeria that I just love it. A lot of African Americans have been force-fed negative information about Nigeria, but uh, I never bought into that. And when I'm there, I hang out in Anugu State, which I think is towards the south. So I have some friends there, brothers and sisters, and we do a lot of work together, Pan-Africanists. My first trip to Nigeria was 2005. Um, I went as Minister of Education for the Garvey Movement. And when I was there, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Chief Azikawe, the Nambi Azikawe's son. And I spent some time with him, got the opportunity to meet with some of the government officials in Nigeria also. Really got an opportunity to see the country. We traveled wide and far, came back in 2008. Right now, we're looking to build a school over there for children. Uh, particularly the young males, and um, it's been a while though, 08, I gotta hurry up and get back. They've been emailing me, they're upset, because I said I would be back by now and I haven't been. So I'm gonna make Nigeria my next trip. I just came back from Liberia a couple weeks ago, but Nigeria is, uh, is real sacred to me, real sacred to me. It's funny because when I got on the airplane to go to Nigeria, the Nigerians on the airplane look the most like African Americans here. And that's how I know that's where we came from. Because although we're all African, the phenotype is different based on the region. So the Africans in South Africa, Malawi, Ethiopia, it was a different phenotype. But I remember when I got on a plane at the e Ethiopia International Airport in Addis Ababa, I flew from there to Lagos. And when the plane boarded, it was amazing because I saw my family. I said, she looks like my mother, he looks like my cousin, that's my uncle, they go grandma. And then, a pastor stood up. This is how I knew we was from Nigeria. Pastor stood up on the plane and led everybody into singing the Gospels on the plane. So when I saw that, I said, I know this is where we come from. So it was good to be here, very good to be here, and I hope this is the beginning of a relationship that we can forge. I'm a Pan-Africanist. So I believe ardently with all my heart and guts and soul that the only way out of our condition as a race is together. I think that there's too much tribalism amongst African people. When I travel the world, I notice that we all have a tendency to think we're better than others. We also have a tendency to distrust each other. When I'm in the Caribbean, there's a Caribbean arrogance there. When I'm in England, there's a black English arrogance in America, we have it. In Africa, you have it. We have it everywhere. And those divisions were actually fabricated by our colonial masters and slave masters. Thank you. Thank you. So we fail to recognize that what we call ourselves is largely the result of oppression, more so than any natural dividing line. So as a Pan-Africanist, we seek to do what? Put all the differences to the side and unite upon our Africanity. We might speak Igbo, or we might speak the Yoruba language, or we might speak Hausa, or we might speak Swahili, or Tweet, or Zulu, but we all African. We might be Muslim, we might be Christian, we might be Jehovah Witness, we might be Seventh-day Adventist, but we all African. Some of us are educated, some of us are not, but we all African. Standing upon that rock is what's going to get us out of our situation. Now, if you don't believe me, that Pan-Africanism is the solution to African people's problems, then listen to what the Europeans have to say. Zbigniew Brzezinski, founder of the Trilateral Commission for the Rockefellers in 1973. This is President Obama's mentor. What did he say about Pan-Africanism? On national television, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that basically there was only one threat to the global world order, permanent European dominance. He said that is a significant economic and political relationship between Africans on the continent and those in America. He said if we allow African Americans to link up meaningfully with Africans on the continent, that could shape 
our permanent control of the international order. So it's important that we take our education and our money and link it to the resources in Africa. Very important that we do that. Why is Africa in the condition that she's in? Africa is in the condition that she's in because after the independent struggle, right at the end of the independent struggles, what happened? Many of the leaders were killed or imprisoned or compromised or whatever the situation was when you look at it nationally. Now we look at Zeke the Great, he was able to overcome a lot of that, but when you look at other countries, that wasn't so. And so what happened was the colonial powers was able to do what? Sit down and sign agreements with leaders who they put in charge. And so after all that fighting, after all that struggle, the European left the continent, but still in control of the economics. The issue with Africa is what? Those structural adjustment programs of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. That's what keeps Africa in the condition that she's in. So Nigeria or Ghana or Malawi or the Congo needs to borrow money. In order to borrow that money, the United States says what? You can borrow it, but we're going to charge you 500% interest on that money. And in addition to taking this money, you're going to have to do what? Open up your economy to international trade, free trade. Let me tell you how free trade works. First of all, it doesn't exist because the European doesn't believe in free trade. They block out competition. So let's say you're in Nigeria, and what's take oil. If the Nigerian government said, we're going to produce our own oil. We don't want nobody bringing oil into Nigeria because we produce our own. Now we know that's not the case. They have Exxon and Mobile, but for the sake of the conversation. So they say, we don't want nobody else's oil in Nigeria. Problem is what? The United States and Britain are going to say, time out. If you want this money, you have to let any of our manufacturers come into your country and sell what they want. Problem with that is what? They can produce oil quicker in America and Britain than you can in Africa. So what happens is what? I take oil out of the ground, go clean it up in the West, bring it back to Africa, and sell it at a price to give people the impression that I didn't even get it from your ground. And what happens to the national oil industry? It folds. Why? Because you can't produce as much as I can produce. You don't have the ability to clean and refine like I do. So ultimately, free market does what? To internal African economies, it cripples it. It makes you and your people dependent on the junk that's sold from the West. They do this in the Caribbean. They do it throughout Africa, Central and South America. They just killed Hugo Chavez a couple days ago. Okay? This is the business of the CIA, the FBI. And as African people, we got to be aware of what's going on. Okay? Patrice Lumumba murdered by the CIA. Kwame Nkrumah overrun by the CIA. Steve Biko, they were involved in his murder. You look at Amakal Cabral, Thomas Sankara. You look at Mamiya Abu Jamal or the Move Nine. And by the way, we got Sister Pan Africa in the house and Sister Ramona Africa in the house. Two freedom warrior sisters out of Philadelphia who came to show me love tonight with Brother Raza Khan. So when we talk about nation building, What's the first thing you got to do to build a nation? You got to force the identity. Our issue is the identity. One thing that separates Africans from everybody else around the world is what? Our in inability to put our differences to the side for the sake of the collective benefit. What do I mean? Let's take the European. I work with Europeans on a daily basis. They compete with each other. They do not like each other. Italians can't stand Jews. Jews can't stand Anglo-Saxons. Anglo-Saxons can't stand Irish. Irish can't stand Southern Europeans. They all think they're better. They fight, they backbite, they undercut. But when it comes time to discuss mutual progress of white people, the petty differences are put on hold long enough for white supremacy to make sure everything's in order, then they go back to fighting. But they're able to have a truce long enough to keep blacks on the bottom. Let's go to the Asians. The Chinese man thinks he's better than the Japanese. The Japanese think he's superior to the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese thinks he's superior to the Taiwanese. The North Koreans think they're better than the South Koreans. So forth and so on. But when it comes to the Asian Union, guess what? 
there's a time out with the fighting. You see it with the Arabs, the Iraqis think they're better than the Afghanis. The Afghanis think they're better than those from Kuwait. Those of Kuwait think they're better than the Iranians, so forth and so on. But when it comes to Arab supremacy, a time I was called, we don't have that ability to do that. Our egos often get in the way. And what is it about the African man, whether he be in Africa, Jamaica, New York City, Canada, or London? What is our problem, black men, that keeps us clashing with each other? It's that ego. And why do we have a bigger ego problem than many men in other races? Because we have not been allowed for expression of our manhood. And as a result of that, when you study the ego of the oppressed male, you find that all oppressed males have an issue with control. They want to dominate everything. Their businesses, their institutions, their women, their children. You look at it, it's an international phenomenon. So in other words, because white supremacy doesn't allow us the opportunity to develop as men, we do what? Overcompensate when we come to the community. We overcompensate when we get home. We overcompensate when we come to the church and we become dictators and tyrants. In other words, we become just like the people we fight. It's an international phenomenon. The first thing that has to be done as it relates to nation building is what? We gotta forge our African identity all over again. Because most of us put other identities before our Africanity. We put our religious identity before being African. We put our education before being African. We put our nationality before being African. You see this all over the planet. It's not just American, it's not just African, it's not just Caribbean or Canadian, it's all of us. There's always something more important than being what God made us, Africa. We got to get back to that. We got to raise our children in such a way that they don't buy into the brainwash of the American social order. You see it, I see it. African children, African American children, especially the ones who are academically elite. These are the kids who are smart, but they get hand-picked in the second and third grade, and they get put in a special program so that their mind is never tainted so they can work for the maintenance of some white supremacy. President Obama, he was handpicked to do that. Colin Powell, he was handpicked to do that. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, he was handpicked to do that. Condoleezza Rice, handpicked to do that. I'm not tearing them down, but I want you to see how they take our best minds, pull them out, shape them and mold them, and use them to their best interest, not yours. Which is why the first thing that must be taught to our children is what? Dedication to one's people. If you don't teach dedication to one's people before you teach math, before you teach science, before you teach military strategy, then your math, your science, your military strategy will be used against your people. Intelligence is one thing. Common sense is something else. And we as Africans have a lot of intelligence, but sometimes we can come up lacking on the common sense meter. What is the most important institution? What is the one thing we got to do right now if we want to resurrect African people? You have to build schools for our children. You guys are a church. You have it a little bit easier. In America, religious schools are the most autonomous of all the four types of schools. What are the four types of schools? Charter school, public school. Now, public school, you know you have basically no control. That's run by the state government. Charter schools are also run by the state government, but if you open up a charter school, you're given the opportunity to do what? Mold the process of education. So a charter school is still a public school. They still have to follow the rules, but the people who run it can modify it as necessary to maximize academic gain. Then you have the independent school. What's the independent school? That's a non-religious school where you basically control nearly everything that goes on in that school. And then you have the religious school. Religious schools are independent, but they have a little bit more freedom than the independent school. Because basically, if you are religious, you basically operate outside the confines of the United States Department of Education and the New York State Department of Education. So whenever I come to a faith-based institution, my first message is what? When y'all want to start building that school? I'll help you. I'll come out, I'll test the kids, I'll let you know where they are. I'm a former school administrator myself and a psychologist. I'll consult with you, okay? But y'all need to start building that institution. Because what they put in your children's brains here in Brooklyn Public School, it ain't African in nature, 
Okay, we got sexual confusion running rampant in the public schools. Okay, we got anti-African instruction running rampant in the public schools. Our African boys are not likely to ever be taught by an African male teacher. So you have a feminization running rampant in the public schools of America. And then we look out in our community and say, what's wrong with our children? Nothing's wrong with our children. The problem is us. Children become what they are allowed to be. So if the child is a killer, someone grew him into a killer. If he's a deadbeat, someone raised him into being a deadbeat. If she's a multiple baby mama, there were parents who were not on the job because girls can't get pregnant when they're being supervised. You don't know of a single girl who's ever gotten pregnant at 14, 15, or 16 while being appropriately supervised. And what is the most trying time for our children? 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. If you do nothing else, make sure you have programming in the church from 3 p.m. until 7 p.m. Because that's when most of our children get arrested. That's when most of our girls get pregnant. That's when most of the young men smoke marijuana or sell it. Three to seven. Guard three to seven. For the young ladies, you got to make sure they're active. A lot of our young women don't want to do anything but be cute. Okay? Look attractive. That's not enough. Get them into sports. The research shows that if a young lady is engaged in athletic activity, after school, on a regular basis, it cuts down the risk of her getting pregnant because you can't get pregnant while you have cheerleading practice or soccer practice. Even if you have your own intramural sports within the church, you need to do that. There's an extermination campaign going on against African people. It is global. The homosexuality movement, that's just one strategy. The abortion, that's just one strategy. Mass incarceration of black men, another strategy. You know what I find really interesting? When I go to Africa, many of the brothers and sisters there, not knowing how life is here, really for us, tend to think that we're doing pretty good in America. In fact, like when I was in Liberia, a lot of brothers and sisters don't know that there's poor blacks in America. They turn on the television and they see LeBron James and Oprah Winfrey and Bill Cosby and Kevin Hart, and they assume that because they're rich, most of us are doing okay because America's propaganda machine does not advertise racism on the international television. But when the African shows up in America, he sees that the ghettos of Brooklyn aren't much different from the ghettos of Lagos. He sees that the ghettos of Philadelphia are not much different than the ghettos of Johannesburg. They might have running water, they might have 24-hour public transportation, they may have electricity that doesn't need a generator, but guess what? They still just as poor. So the idea is what? Not to run away from where we at, but to build it up. Black people in America are dealing with this right now. What is going on in all the neighborhoods across this country? It's happening in Brooklyn, Harlem, Queens, Philadelphia, D.C., Richmond, Houston, what's happening? Europeans are coming into the inner city and taking it back. They say, you know what? If black people are going to follow us wherever we move to, why keep moving around? They love us too much to leave us alone. So why don't we give them the suburbs and we take the inner city? And that's what they're doing. Coming back, raising the property value, forcing our elders to sell homes that they bought 30 years ago because they can't pay the taxes so they can come in and take back over the industry. So the other thing that we have to make sure we do, wherever the money is housed at for the church, make sure that that bank is not working in cooperation with the gentrification movement. In Philadelphia and other places, the black churches are depositing money into banks that are using that money to finance blacks out of their own neighborhood. Make sure you're not guilty of that because too many of us are not looking at how our money gets used by these white institutions. When we build our schools for our children, what do we need to teach our children? Number one, agricultural science. Our children have to learn how to grow. 
They have to learn how to eat. McDonald's is killing our people. When I go to Africa now, I see McDonald's popping up. And wherever the McDonald's is popping up, cancer is popping up. Heart disease is popping up. Remember when we was a primitive people, we didn't catch them diseases. But when we got modern and high tech, we started dying from the same diseases that the European died from. Like I always tell black women in America, I say, one of the reasons why your birthing experience is so painful is because you want to have babies the way the white woman had babies. Stretched out on the couch. I said, you go to the village in Africa, you don't get stretched out on the couch. When it's time to have a baby, the queen mothers escort you into a certain building or a certain room and you squat down and you let gravity pull the baby out. Okay? It's real simple. A couple grunts, a couple moans, and they go to life. But when y'all come to America, y'all want to get sophisticated. We want to be comfortable. And so the doctor puts the epidural in your spine, and the epidural leaks into the baby's bloodstream, and now the baby heart beating like this, and the next moment they say, what? We got to cut you open. Because the baby heart moving too fast. And if we don't get the baby out, we might lose them. So then they cut you, give you a C-section, and now every time you come back for another baby, they want to cut you open again. Do you know why? Because C-sections are simpler, and it's also considered emergency surgery. So they get paid more money for the C-section. This is about economics. This ain't about you. Which is why I encourage black women to go to midwifery school. You need to get your midwifery license. Now, back home in Africa, we didn't necessarily need that because having babies was a part of the culture. But in America, they regulated, so they say you gotta have a license to help women have their babies in their homes. Y'all need to do that. That's a significant source of income for women of African descent in this country. Do you know what the white women are charging to come to your house and deliver your baby? Five, seven, ten thousand dollars to deliver a baby in your house. Why can't you make that money? A sister who's living as a midwife can deliver 10 kids for the year and be done. And be done, economically. So see, we gotta make sure we don't get caught up into what white folks wanna do. If we wanna build nation, we gotta do what? Take inventory of what's in our best interests. What's in your best interests? Going to their hospitals, is that in your best interests? Our kids being sexually confused, I got fourth and fifth graders running over to me talking about I'm gay, I'm lesbian, in the third grade, can't even spell it. Is that in your best interest? What's the next science? Military and political science. You gotta teach that. Military and political science. Why do you gotta teach that? Well, political science is we need our children to be intelligent about what's happening in the African world today. In other words, where did AIDS come from? Our children need to know that the AIDS virus was created by the United States Army Bioweapons Lab in Fort Detrick, Maryland with a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to rid the world of African people about 50% by the year 2000. If you don't believe it, you can check the congressional record. It's there, Global 2000. Jimmy Carter cut the black population in half. That's where AIDS came from. Homosexuality came on the tail end of that. Make the black men gay, give them the AIDS, they give it to their women. And now AIDS is the number one killer of black women on the face of the earth, 38 to 58. Because of what? Bisexual brothers. It ain't about whether you believe people are born that way or not. That ain't the issue. The issue is, does the behavior benefit us? Y'all get all caught up into this. Well, I don't know, my brother always looked kind of soft. I don't care about that. Does the behavior benefit us? And if you tell me that it existed on the continent prior to the arrival of the European, show me evidence. There's very few references to male and male sexual behavior in Africa prior to the Judeo Christian code, and that's kind of late. Where is it? Now we go to Greece and Rome, we know that that was a regular behavior. Yeah. Apollo, Zeus, Napoleon, Julius Caesar, nearly all of the philosophers believed in man-boy love. And by the way, in case you don't know, this book right here, 
This is our Bible in psychology and psychiatry. This is the mental health Bible. Everything we diagnose you with, come out of here. Depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, borderline, narcissism, histrionic, anxiety disorder, ADHD. What is ADHD? And I'm getting mad at my African brothers and sisters who come into America because y'all get hooked on this too with y'all kids. I see them in the school. You don't give them no medicine for no, he can't sit still. He can't sit still because the teacher is a poor instructor. She's boring. Of course he ain't going to sit still. Why are you letting your common sense go? If I'm not keeping his attention, he's going to find something else to do. Forty years ago, it wasn't ADHD. But now, because Wall Street found a way to get paid, make money, they came up with ain't no daddy at home disorder. <laughs> and if the daddy is home, it's ain't no discipline at home disorder. But you say, well, my husband's in the house. I said ain't no discipline at home disorder. Kids do what they want in that house. And they come to school unruly. White middle class female teachers, she don't even want to be teaching the black kids anyway, whether they immigrants or not. Black is black. We put ourselves in groups. White folk don't do that. Hello. So as far as they're concerned, they can all get a pill. Let me ask you a question. What does Ritalin, Concerta, Cycler, Stratera, I believe also goes in that category, what do they have in common with crack cocaine and opium? You know what they all have in common? They are all listed by the Drug Enforcement Agency of the United States as a Schedule II drug. That means it's one of the most addictive drugs you can take, and the abuse potential is one of the highest in the country. And this is what you give your son every day so he can sit still long enough to be miseducated. Shame on you, not the child. Not the child. And what I'm finding, a lot of us like the excuse that comes with a diagnosis. See, we like stuff like conduct disorder. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let, let me give you one for example. Here's opposition of defiant disorder, ODD. So you got ADHD, you got CD, you got ODD. Let's talk about ODD. What's the symptoms? Loses his temper, argues with adults, doesn't follow rules, deliberately annoys people, <laughs> blames others for his mistakes, is touchy or easily annoying, is angry and resentful, is spiteful or vindictive. That's half the black people I know. <laughs> but let's go a little bit further. Does that sound like an illness to you? Or just a mindset? Or just a mood state? That's not, would you give somebody medicine for that? But that's what they do. Here we go right here. In fact, all of you need to buy you one of these, especially if you're raising an African male. You need to have this in your pocketbook or your back pocket. $35, you need this. So when someone comes to you talking about my son got conduct disorder, you open up to conduct disorder, and you read it, and you say, well, let me see. Because they say, go take them to the psychiatrist to get tested. You're going to say, I don't need to do that. First, let me check myself. So you open up your book, and you say, let me see here. Bullies and threatens people, initiates fights, is physically cruel to people, physically cruel to animals, has stolen from somebody, has forced someone into sexual activity, has set fires, has destroyed property, broken into somebody's house, lies to obtain goods, has stolen items, stays out at night, runs away from home. Does that sound like an illness to you? That sound like a boy who needs his behind spat. You need no drug for this. See, boys who grow up with strong men in their life, you don't catch these diseases. My father was a drill instructor for the United States Marine Corps. Paris Island, South Carolina, the big hat. Do you think I can catch this? Daddy, I think I got ADHD. Really? <laughs> no pills, no medicine, no eval, no nothing. Good old fashioned leather, Sonder. 
So I'm telling you, parents, you got to get your common sense back. So the second science is political and military. What do I mean by military? Military science and political science are the same thing. I want to make sure we're clear. Business is military science, OK? Political science is fighting without physical confrontation. City Hall, Congress, you have a business, you compete with the Arabs or the East Indians and the Asians. That's military combat, but it's political. Military is when you take out the guns and the bombs and the guts. Okay? We need to teach our young men how to defend their neighborhood. I don't want him taking anybody's life. But God forbid if something happened in Brooklyn and he was at home with his mother and his brothers and his little sisters, I need him to know how to get that AK, load it up, and point that sucker the right way. That's right. Not that I ever want him to have to use it, but in case he needs it, it's there. You don't ever want your house to catch on fire, but you got a fire extinguisher. You have to prepare for the impreparable if that's a word. Is that Ebonics? <laughs> <laughs> so what's the next science? Financial and economic. Financial, that's where we lose. When I was in Liberia a couple weeks ago, I'm in Monrovia, and I'm standing, I'm just studying this. Arab, East Indian, Chinaman. I'm just looking. I said, we ain't got one black-owned store in an all-black country. When I was in Nigeria, I studied. When I was in Port Harcourt in Abuja, I'm looking, and I'm looking at the chicken market. We even buy some chicken. We wasn't selling none. It was all Asians. One brother pulled me to the side. I'm talking to him while we waiting for the bus. And Port Harcourt, he said, you know what, Brother Umar? Do you know that the Chinese man has basically cornered the Nigerian chicken market? He said, if you want chicken in Nigeria, you got to get it from somebody who come from another country. In an all-black country. So that's why we got to teach our children economic science. How do we take back the chicken market? Economic science. How do we get the oil out of Africa ourselves and use it for the benefit of Africa's people? Isn't it amazing that Africa is the richest continent, but the people have the lowest per capita income? White supremacy. And if you don't understand white supremacy, you won't understand anything else you see that will confuse you because you fail to recognize the invisible hand. The invisible hand. And we got to teach our children about white supremacy, not to hate nobody. Don't confuse white supremacy instruction with hating white people. I believe that hatred is too great of a burden to bear. I think it's a negative emotion that kills the person who carries it more than the person they hold it for. So I don't believe in teaching him to hate Europeans. But I want him to understand the way they think. I want him to understand the way they act. I want him to understand the way that they function. Because military science is about calm, cool, intellectual forethought. It is not about emotional reactivity. And that's where we mess up as a people. Because sometimes we let our emotions cloud our logic. We're known for that. We're known for that. And we have to do what? Overcome that situation. What's the next science? In addition to financial and economic, I want him to be an international banker. I want, me, I want to be able to come to his bank and say, young brother, I need two billion dollars. I'm about to build 10 independent schools for African children. I'm going to put one in Canada, one in London, two in Africa, one in the Caribbean, two in America, one in South Central America. And he's going to give me the loan because he's going to be a master of banking. We ain't got that. You know what we got? Credit card, debit card, check and savings. <laughs> and that ain't helping us. When we die, what do we leave the next generation? Our debt. Our debt. White kids, what they got? They got the parents' family savings. What do our kids get? Your daddy's still old on his BMW. 40,000. BMW played out now. He got the 1980 version with the leopard seats. He don't even want to drive that. But daddy did.
So he got to pay it off. So we got agricultural science, economic science, political science. What's the next science? The next science is the science of diet and nutrition. How to eat to live. When I was in synagogue, one of my buddy's grandmothers had to be flown from synagogue to France for medical attention. I said, how are these brothers and sisters in Africa getting sick? And the brother said, because the food, they say most of the stuff we eat gets imported from Asia. In Europe, dirty rice, dirty vegetables, GMO. And so they said, because we're not growing our own food anymore, guess what? People coming down with diseases they never had. Cancer on the rise all throughout Africa. It's already high here. Because we've been in love with McDonald's. Y'all just fell in love with McDonald's. So we got to teach dietary nutritional science. And what's the last two sciences, y'all? One is science of the African family. The Americanization of African people has done what? It has separated the male from the female. It has turned the male against the female and the female against the male. So the black man doesn't think he needs his woman. And some of the women don't think they need their men. All African people in America, I don't care if you're from North Philly, West Philly, Brooklyn, Nigeria, or Ethiopia, we are in love with women who don't look like our mothers. Make it play. Am I wrong? I see it all the time. Whether he African American or African immigrant, nothing better than to get a European wife. I got quiet because some of y'all are probably guilty, and I don't even care. <laughs> Because I'm a truth teller. So if I step on your toes, I don't really care. I really don't. Love is blind. You teach your children this. Love is blind, is it? Because if love is blind, then somebody in here better explain to me. Why when I did a research project in college on interracial relationships, I found that 98% was committed by black men. Right. That black men marry outside their race more than the men of all the other races put together. So if love is blind, why is yours extra blind? <laughs> but let's go a little bit further. Not only did I find that interracial marriage was almost exclusively a black male thing, I found that most of the time, the white woman or Asian woman or Catholic Asian woman or tropical looking woman that he married had less than what he had. That she always gained something in the marriage. All the time. So whether you Russell Simmons or Kobe Bryant, whether you Tay Diggs or Cuba Good Jr. or just the brother working down on the corner. The woman you marry always gains something materially from the marriage. So if you're telling me that love is blind, if you're telling me that you can't help who you fall in love with, then why can't I find a rich white woman who couldn't help but fall in love with a broke brother? <laughs> if it's so blind, show me one. Show me one in New York. <laughs> Show me one in Africa, a millionaire white woman, she ain't got to be a millionaire, she could just be comfortable <laughs> with a broke black man. You ain't never seen it. Because <laughs> love ain't blind. Right. It's only blind for you. <laughs> so yes, I believe black men should be with black women. Right. Look at the marriage rate of black women in this country. It's bad. Okay? And we got to work on that. And the last science is what? Spiritual science. I don't have an issue with church. I come from pastors all in my line. Great grandfather, great grandfather, pastor. My uncle is a pastor up in Philadelphia. I come from church. In fact, in my family, I got everything. I got Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh day Adventists, I got Baptists, I got Gods and Earths, Nation of Islam. I got people who made up their own religion. <laughs> they got their own book. Religion is good. 
But my problem with us who do go to church is what? We got a habit of letting the children decide if they want to come or not. Let me get this right. I'm going to church to serve the Lord, but if you want to stay home and play video games, you can do that. What kind of stuff is that? I'm going to serve the Lord, but you can stay home and serve the devil. My God. And so now our children committing suicide at a rate higher than at any time in our history. Who has the fastest growing suicide rate in the United States of America? African American and African immigrant boys from 12 to 17, the percentage has increased 800% since 1980. You know why? Because you come into church to get your spirit right, but you ain't making sure he got his right. You don't go to church without your children. Now I was looking around the head, I want to give y'all some humble praise. Because normally when I come into a church, what's the first thing I check for as a psychologist? Why in Christ? And I don't see one in here. And that's beautiful. Now I know if I go to some of your houses, I'll see them there. Now you might ask, what that like my uncle said, what does it matter what color Christ was? Well, if it don't matter, why did the European change the image of every picture, every statue of Jesus the Christ everywhere on earth for a process of over a thousand years? If it didn't matter, why did he do it? Now, because I'm a psychologist and you're not, I'm going to explain to you how it matters. <laughs> Your brain is an image-associating machine. Everything that you know is saved as a picture. Your address is encoded as a picture. Your family pictures. Your job, everything is a picture. Your brain is like a camera. Everything is a picture. And then from them pictures, it does what? Associate and generalize. So if he's raised from birth to see Jesus as a white man, picture of Christ every week, why? The brain associates. So automatically he begins to reason logically that if God is white, then all white men in some way, shape, form, or fashion must be godly. Right. Subconsciously, without even knowing it, he adopts a servitude posture in front of white males because he was raised on a diet of a white Christ. If you don't believe me, do your research. I'll debate anyone on that fact. It is a psychological fact that teaches whoever your deity is, if your deity is your enemy, then you are consenting to voluntary servitude. Now, where did the white Christ come from? The picture. Where's the picture? The picture was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, who was the other uh, homosexual artist? Okay, right. Leonardo. When did he paint the picture of Jesus and the 12 disciples? The Last Supper was painted in what year? 1482. Ten years before Columbus set sail for the New World. Was that a coincidence? No. Because Columbus's greatest weapon was the white Christ. So that he could do what? Reduce the servitude all infidel peoples. To teach them that this is the Religion, but I'm not dealing with the beliefs, y'all. I want to be clear. Because somebody said, "You talk about religion." My grandmother Christian. I would never talk about grandmother's religion. <laughs> but I'm talking about the pictures. Had nothing to do with your belief. The pictures that we use, which were introduced by who? The colonialist and the slave master. Leonardo painted that picture. Do you know who he used to pose? <laughs> he used his family. Not only did he use family, they were all inmates at a local prison. <laughs> so, if you got a picture of that, sweet 13, then you are worshiping pedophiles and criminals without even knowing it. Now, there is a black last summer. You ain't even got to use theirs, because we got our own. 
in the Coptic Church in the Cairo Museum in Kemet is a black Christ with the 12 disciples. Blue, black, purple, not tan, Caucasian, or biracial. Black! <laughs> you can buy a picture from Dr. Renoko Rashidi. I own one. So we actually have the original black Christ last supper. Hang that one up in your house. But you don't have 13 criminals on the wall, and then you pray to God and wonder why we don't get our prayers answered because we pray to the enemy's deity, not our own. Take your plane. Spiritual incarceration. Now, let me say this. American public school system, including the colonial school systems of Africa, the United Kingdom, and the Caribbean, are not designed to teach our children how to think. They are designed to teach them what to think. Education is the most revolutionary institution in the community if it's done right. Ten years of constructive, corrective education can change the mindset of the African to what it is, from what it is, to what it needs to be. People say, well, why are you focusing on schools? Shouldn't we be focusing on jobs and industry? Shouldn't we be building a hospital or an airline? Shouldn't we be building some type of infrastructure? What is my answer to that? My answer to that, if you try to build anything with mentally sick Africans, right. all of us, <laughs> you're not going to get anywhere because we don't think like Africans. We think like Europeanized Africans. I don't care if he was born in Africa, America, or London. We are outside of our minds. And until we recognize that, we'll never be able to solve the problem. Because in order to cure a sick person, they got to admit that they have a contamination. All right. That's post-traumatic slavery disorder. That's a four-hour lecture. We have to stay all night, so I'm not going to pour that one up. Okay? <laughs> but what I do want to do is I want to give y'all some strategies you can use to protect your children in the schools. Because one thing I know about public school, because up in Philadelphia, I work with the Liberian immigrant children, the uh, Ghanaian immigrant children, the Nigerian immigrant children, the Sierra Leonean immigrant children. Southwest Philadelphia, that's, the, that's where they bring all the African immigrants. They segregate, the government does this. So what I do up there is I educate the parents because they know y'all don't know the law. So they break it, they say they just came from the continent. They don't know special ed law in America, so we just want to railroad them. And what is the biggest law that they break with African immigrant children? Number one, if they don't speak proper English, which makes it difficult for them to receive the education, instead of giving them ESOL, English as a second language, where they get acculturated into the language, they put them in special education. You've got hundreds of African children in special ed who do not have a learning disability. They do not have a learning disability. They are in there because they don't understand English and the school don't want to spend the money to pay for an ESOL. ESOL is English as a second language. Y'all need to remember that. E-S-O-L. You ask the principal for an ESOL evaluation. My son doesn't speak English. he got to be taught it. They get an Esau eval, the Esau teacher teaches him English, life goes on. No special ed, but they don't want to spend the money for the Esau teacher. So what's the best way to deal with the kids who can't speak English? Well, throw them in special ed. And now your child walking around with an IEP. Mm. This is what they do to the African immigrant children. I see it all the time. One thing y'all going to have is I'm going to give y'all my phone number and my email. So if you ever need to reach me about any child, all you got to do is email me what's going on with your child, and I'll tell you how to work through that situation. Now, here's the first thing that's going to happen. First thing is what? What should I do if the school wants me to evaluate my child? You got a letter in the mail. We would like to evaluate your son. We think he got a behavior problem or a learning problem. What should you do? Number one, you should tell them that you want the request in writing with a description or explanation of why you want my son tested for a learning disability. What do you see in the class with my son that makes you think he's different from the other children in that school? Get it in writing. Don't do the verbal. Because when you do the verbal, you ain't got no proof that they said what they said. So they love to deal with you verbally. 
I want y'all to stop the verbal and get it written down. And then, when you look at why they want your son tested, your next question want to be what? You said my son is in the sixth grade, but he's reading on the third grade level. He's three grade levels behind his class. Well, here's the question. Can you tell me what the average reading level of the other kids in his classroom is? Because when you find out what the average reading level of the other children in the class, you want to find that they ain't too much higher than your son. Why? Because of miseducation in America, the average African-American child, male or female, is two grades below where they should be. So if your son is two or three grade levels below, the question to the teacher or principal is why did you single out my son for special ed when the whole class is low? Are y'all following me? Right. <clears throat> when teachers give me kids to evaluate, I say, hold on. He's three grades behind. How many grades are the other kids in the class behind? Because if he ain't no further behind than them, why are we singling him out? He don't need special ed. The whole class needs an improvement in the curriculum. Do y'all see that? <laughs> and the purpose of special ed is what, y'all? To make money. When I put your kid in special ed, they get what? A 100% increase in the funding. Did you know that? Oh, special ed is a business. Welcome to America. It's a hustle. Brooklyn schools. He gets, and you don't mind me pointing that, he's just a young brother. He gets $8,000 a year spent on his education. Hypothetically, in New York City schools, it's about $8,000 per child. Once I say he got a learning disability, he's mentally retarded, ADHD, autism, deaf, blind, traumatic brain injury, orthopedic impairment, multiple disability, developmental delay, he's now worth $8,000 no more. He's worth $16. They get an extra eight and they get an extra eight every year in special ed. That's right, money. So, let's say he goes with special ed. He's in there for two years, and he don't need it no more. What's the chances of the principal telling you that I want you to sign your son out because he don't need this no more? What's the chances? Zero. Zero. You know why? Because when I exit him from special ed, what happens to the money I was getting? It leaves my, my, my account. They don't put the black boys in special ed to help them. They put them in special ed so they can be done with them. United States Department of Education said what? A black boy put in special education is not likely to learn how to read on grade level by the time he graduates. Special ed ain't nothing but racial inferiority instruction. Now I want y'all to stop getting them tested unless you think something wrong. Now let's say he got a speech and language impairment. That ain't due to the fact that he's speaking African language, but a true disability. We're going to get him some speech there. If he got true autism, we're going to get him some autism support. That's not my problem. My problem is learning disability, emotional disturbance, and mild mental retardation. Those are the three you got to look out for. When somebody tells you your child might have a learning disability, you got to be careful. And the reason you got to be careful is why? Can I prove a learning disability? No. no. Can I prove mental retardation? No. Can I prove emotional disturbance? Can I prove ADHD? Can I prove conduct disorder? Can I prove it? Uh -uh. Everything in this book, at the end of the day, is a what, y'all? Professional opinion. That's all it is. It's a professional opinion. Problem is you take that opinion and you make it into a self-fulfilling prophecy that gets projected onto the children. We got to wake up. See, in my school, there ain't going to be no special ed. And I want all the ladies to know that in my school, because I believe in African fundamentalism. See, I'm more African than people who come from Africa. Not y'all. What other folk? There will be no non-African hair in my school. When the girls come to the Frederick Douglass and Amy Douglas, excuse me, Anna Douglas and Amy Jakes and Ashwood Academy. If your daughter shows up in my school with anything other than her God-given hair, I shave it. I'm also a barber. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm a trained barber. I ain't got my license because they put me in college prep. Okay, I just want y'all to know because I see your eyes like, oh, no, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm a shaver. 
<laughs> because I want our, our women to be proud of what God did. We ain't trying to look like Beyonce. Okay? She don't want to look like And we got to work on that. And we're not knocking the sisters, brothers, because you know what? A lot of us don't want a sister who look natural. Even the brothers who consider themselves conscious. I had a sister send me an email. She said, Brother Umar, I shaved my hair off. I went natural. Went back to my man. He red, black, and green. I thought he would be happy. He said, what you do that for? I wanted you to be conscious, but not that conscious. So my point is, brothers, we got to watch the messages that we send to our women. It ain't all their fault. See, the black woman gets attacked through her physical beauty. The black man gets attacked through his definition of manhood. In other words, they keep us from getting a job, and they keep them from accepting a natural look. It's the same war, but it's two different phases. We're going to attack her definition of beauty, and we're going to attack his manhood responsibility. As I prepare to wrap up, let me hit a few more of these questions. Okay, here's a good one. Can the school reduce your child's grades based on behavior? Yes. Well, no, they cannot. Do they do it? Yes. Is it legal? No. If the teacher told you he was going to get an A, but he talked too much, so I'm going to give him a B, that's illegal. You cannot reduce a child's grade based on behavior. Y'all need to know this. That's why they have on every report card, they have a what? Academic grade, A, B, C, D, F, and behavior. One, two, three, four, five. I normally got fives. <laughs> right? So I need y'all to know because if the teacher ever reduced your son's grade, you're going to write a letter saying, my son get an A, not a B, because you can't reduce grades based on behavior. And if she thinks she can, because a lot of teachers don't know the law, you're going to write a letter to the superintendent. And you're going to carbon copy the chair of the local school board. And you're going to carbon copy the chancellor of the State Department of Education. And you're going to carbon copy your state rep and your state senator. you got to know these people. These are the people who supervise education. And then what y'all need to do is you get organized with the African-American parents. But then you also have a subcommittee of the African parents to deal with issues that are affecting your children in the public schools. You say, well, you know what? We got certain issues with our African children here in Brooklyn. We need to tackle that. You form a committee. You got to get organized. Then you call me up. I'm going to quarterback the whole game plan for you. But I'm not going to go with you because if they see me, that's it. <laughs> you want to go in there and go fight the battle. OK? Listen to me. A lazy African parent is like no parent at all. Right. You cannot afford to be lazy. Too many of us are lazy. African immigrant, African American, we lazy. We send our kids to the school, and then we just say, get a good education, but we don't supervise it. And then I got to go around explaining why his IQ score is 10 points lower than the white boy's IQ. And why his IQ score is 15 points lower than the Chinese kid. That's my job. I got to explain why our kids can't keep up. Now, we know the tests were designed for them to do poorly. We know that, right? But you also have a responsibility. All of us who are parents. And you know what that is? Not making sure they spend time doing their homework. How much time do you spend doing homework now? On a weekday, be honest with you. I'm done with high school. Oh, you, you, oh my God, you like a young boy. You done too, though. What grade you? How, how, you seem pretty sharp. You got a tie. In. <laughs> how, how, how much time you spend on homework at night? You spend four hours. Yeah, I started. Okay, so you say you start, then you take a nap, then you get up, so you. <laughs> but the issue is that our children, stay with me, middle class Asian child, how long do they study? 12 to 15 hours a week outside of school, middle class Asian. White child, middle class, 8 to 12 hours a week outside of school, white middle class. Black children in the inner city, how much? 45 minutes. <laughs> 45 minutes, because they got better things to do. Now, here's my question to all the parents. Who in here got $250 million, excuse me, $250,000 tucked away 
in a bank account for your child to get an education. Ain't none of us got that type of money. Now, some of y'all might be related to the brother Nigeria who bought that airport. A Nigerian brother is one of the richest men in the world. Who related to him? Because I need that connect. Who in here? None of y'all know him. And I need that connect. I need that, seriously. You know him? Y'all know him? You got to connect, Elder? All right, all right, you sure? Okay, now check. Let me know. I need that. I need that. He buy airports in England. I need that. That's the good old pet Africanism. But my point is, you got to make your child study. Homework is holy. Every night in your house for one hour, I should be able to hear a pin drop for one hour, 60 minutes. Now, they in high, he in high school. It should be 120 minutes. Okay? But at least 60 minutes. Quiet hour. If they ain't got no homework, you give them some. You make them read. Because you know it's the vocab that gets our children. Y'all do know that, right? It ain't that the white kids are bright. They just understand the words. Thank you. And your children don't understand the words. Because we don't send them to the public library. When the last time you took your kid, and I'm going to come to you in a second. When the last time you took your kid to the public library? Anybody in there? To do something other than check Facebook and Twitter. I said, boss! <laughs> we don't take it. They don't read. Four reasons why you read. Why do we need our kids to read, y'all? Four reasons. Number one, it increases vocab. Number two, it increases general knowledge of facts and information. Number three, it improves communication. Number four, it enhances their writing skills. Vocabulary, writing skills, communication, general facts and information. That's the SAT test. Make it plain. All you got to do is make them read non-fiction books. I'm not talking about that ghetto book stuff. <laughs> and y'all laugh because y'all be reading. <laughs> and I'm with the pastor when they come to church, open up their pocketbook, and you better not see none of that ghetto trash next to the holy book. Burn it! Uh. What, what is he going to learn? He's going to be getting ready for the SAT soon. What are you going to read in a book with a woman on the cover half dress? With a man with a ski mask and two guns? What you going to learn? Ain't no vocab in that. That stuff ain't going to show up on the SAT test. Y'all need to burn all that garbage. I don't even know why we sell it. It ain't helping nobody. You know what I bought the other day? Coincidence. I was in Baltimore. I bought uh, Selected Speeches of the Namdia's Eagle Way. It just got published. It's just a coincidence I'm here today, but I just bought that because the Namdia's Eagle Way is near, near and dear to me. He's one of those most underrated African nationalist revolutionary freedom fighters. He actually went to school outside of Philadelphia. If y'all don't know, Lincoln University, same place where Kwame and Kuma went to school, That's right. up in Philadelphia. And he was a member of Marcus Garvey's UNIA while he was up there. So I studied uh, the great Z because he was. He was a good man. I'm going to be the next one, though. Stay with me. <laughs> but as we wrap it up, the mic came off. Test it. <laughs> you got to drink enough water, too. Y'all young bucks, y'all drinking enough water? You need that. Black men, black men, stay away from red and green food diet. Black men, red and green food dye. Stay, no Kool-Aid. No more Kool-Aid. Okay? Why? Because that contributes to prostate cancer. If it got red and food, red and green food dye, stay away from it. Okay? Prostate cancer for black men. But you want to eat natural red and green foods. Tomato, green, you need that to maintain prostate health, but you don't want to eat artificial red and green because it messed up your prostate. Yeah. And we also know what, y'all? That the brain drugs that we give our children messes with their reproductive organs. I hope y'all listen. For those of y'all who got your sons on kitty crack, you got your sons on crack for kids, this is going to mess up his ability to have children later. Okay, I need y'all to understand. And by the, by the way, anything I tell you, I don't want you to believe me. I want you to go and do your own research. Thank you. Because most of the stuff that I say you never heard before, you won't never hear again. And because I'm not white, you're likely to dismiss me. Because that's the Negro thing. <laughs> okay, I know Negro psychology. Okay?
He's like, ah, he was crazy. Right. Okay? Until they put your kid in special ed and won't let him out, and then you call me to help save him. Because that's what y'all do. Y'all go to the white people first and come to me second. Like I'm the thrift shop or something. And I'm a little proud of myself, finally. Two days ago, my first book got released. Two days ago. It's called The Psychoacademic Holocaust, the Special Ed and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. He's handsome on the cover, ain't he? That's me. Anyway, this book you need to read. Not for me, but for them. In this book, you're going to learn how they do special ed and how to fight it. In this book, you're going to learn how they do ADHD and how to fight it. In this book, I'll show you. Right here. The brain drugs that they give our children, how much money they make, and the side effects. For example, Abilify. That's a drug. They give it for schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. What are the side effects? Constipation, anxiety, abnormal heartbeat, blurred vision, sleeplessness. And how much money do they make from Abilify every year? Five billion. Oh my Jesus. Oh, you need this. So the next time you want to go buy one of them little black trash novels, sacrifice it for this. Now the last chapter, I got questions for parents. You might say, I got an issue with my son. I don't know what to do. So you flip to the back. What can I do if I want my child removed from special ed? And I'll tell you how to get them out of special ed. How to get them gifted. So this is something you keep in your pocketbook, mothers, and in your back pocket, dads. Okay? So when you got an issue, you don't let them see you pull out my book, though. Right. You go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and then you sneak peek. Because if you show them this, they're going to know you're what? Then they're going to buy one, okay? And then they're going to speak. So you keep, don't let nobody, in fact, you take your notes before you go to the beat. Cop, no, no, copy, no, no. Take your notes, okay? And then you be prepared. But this is your weapon. First book written to show you how to get your children out and away for special ed in the ADHD wolves, okay? So I have some for sale at the end if you're interested. Brother LeRon ain't making, so when we're done, I'll run out and get a box of books. Some of y'all might be interested. Also brought some of my DVDs, in case some of y'all like to do the video thing. Okay? I got male-female relationships, post-traumatic slavery disorder, military science, showing how our ancestors overcame the European. Okay? I got about 50 different DVDs, something for everybody. Okay? But it ain't no BET or none of them. Okay? So I just want to be clear. In conclusion, let me say this. We, as African people, can never give up on our ability to resurrect our reality. The whole world wants us to think that we done. They want Africa to think we done. They want us in America, the Caribbean, London, Canada. I travel all over. I'm everywhere. They want them to think they done. So wherever I go, I see African people feeling hopeless. I look on their faces in Liberia, Nigeria, Senegal. Canada, Jamaica, Bermuda. I look on the faces of our people and we look like we Never give up hope. I don't care how bad it gets. Never give up the hope. And the strength of the religious order, the strength of the church is what? You make sure people don't give up the hope. Look at the example of Jesus Christ, the black man. <laughs> Look at the example of Christ. Here was a man who stood up to the world and said, it ain't but one God, and I'm the son of God. And the Romans said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't say that around him. Even his own Hebrew preacher and the elders derided him, assassinated his character. And that black man stood up again. He said, I came to do what? to bear witness to the truth, period. Nothing you do to me gonna stop my message. My message to the Christian brothers and sisters is you got to be like Christ. He didn't fear nothing. Couldn't be bought out for nothing. Be that, which we claim to be. Christ was a revolutionary. I read the Gospels. See, I do all kinds of stuff people don't know. I get inspiration from Jesus Christ. No, I'm being serious, I do. 
Okay? And we know he's actually born in my month, August. He was not born December 25th. Right? He was changed by the church. He was a Leo, like me. Oh, Leo, lion, son! Yes. So I take inspiration from the God. No! I'm not joking. I read the Gospels. I got a copy in my car. I'm not lying to you. Sometimes when things get a little tough for me, I pull out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I read what he had to say. I get inspiration from that. There's strength in the Bible. If it's used correctly, the Bible could be a revolutionary tool. Problem is so often our community is used as what? Exploitation and mind control. But it could be revolutionary. Honorable Marcus Messiah Bobby was a Christian. Thank you. Gave us the largest black organization of all time. He was a Christian man. So it don't matter if you're Muslim or Christian. Uh-uh. I'm looking for whether or not you manifest God in your life. Hmm. Give it a test. And when they come back to the white person, they're not going to consider uh, extraneous variables. You follow me? They're not going to look at home life. White people never look at the home life of our kids. Are y'all listening to me? They're not going to say, well, his father's in jail. Maybe they got something to do with it. His grandmother died last year. Maybe they got something to do with it. His parents are getting divorced. The mother doesn't really participate in his education. He don't really do homework. They don't care about intangibles. And why? Because number one, the intangibles block them from doing what they want to do with the children. And number two, they believe our kids are intellectually inferior in the first place. I mean, y'all heard of the Bell Curve book, right? Yeah. Which was a bestseller in 1999. Okay, white folk believe black people are intellectually inferior. Look at all the fathers of the IQ test. Terman, racist. Wexler, racist. Uh, uh, Goddard, racist. Binet, racist. All the men who developed IQ tests were staunch believers in African racial inferiority. And you wonder why the kids keep scoring 10 points below on the test. When the men who made the tests hmm. believed that they were inferior. That's why when we study our history, we got to study the intellectual racism in American history. The SAT test. I got a quote in my book from uh, the guy who started the SAT test. You know that was a racist who started the SAT test? The whole testing movement came out of racial inferiority, y'all. When they test our kids, they're not testing to see how well he's been taught. They're testing, hoping he get a certain score so they can justify denying them opportunity. It's about the denial of opportunity to black children. The test is the new Jim Crow. Before, it'll be a sign that said what? No blacks. Instead, it don't say that. It says what? No score below 700. Do y'all see that? No, they use the number to take the place of the Jim Crow no Negro sign. The test is the new no Negro sign. Here's the thing, by making sure that they are taught loyalty to race first. See, if you're taught loyalty to race first, you can be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, it doesn't matter because you're never gonna work against the best interests of your children or your community. Take me, I was one of them who was chosen. It just so happened that my ancestors wouldn't let me do nothing else. You follow know what I'm saying? So I, all I could do is walk the straight and narrow. I was never supposed to get what I got. I just played the role during the interview. I could play like the rest of them. Okay? But you got to teach that loyalty. That's all we got to do. The difference between the gatekeeper and the spook who sat by the door or somebody who's going to use their education to benefit their community is the difference between a community or a group of parents who taught them loyalty to race versus those who taught them loyalty to the country. See, we teach our children to be good Americans, but a good black American is not good for black America. Because you're not taught to do us in the best interest of your people. The interest of America is a significant competing agenda when compared to what's best for African people globally. You follow what I'm saying? So if you're loyal to the America, then that means you're loyal to the status quo. And if you're loyal to the status quo, you must be loyal to white supremacy because white supremacy is the spirit of America. And you cannot separate the two. You look at the United States Constitution. To this very day, it says that we're not human beings. To this very day, it says we're three-fifths of a man. You look at the Declaration of Independence, which Thomas Jefferson plagiarized, but yet and still, the original language said that all men were born equal. They made him change it to create it equal. Because they said if you say all men are born equal, you're saying that all black children born in American soil are free by birth. And we don't agree to that. We the state create free men. And so you look at all the signers of the Declaration of Independence. 
three-fourths of them slave masters or who participate in the slave regime. You look at the, the, the holidays that our children are taught to worship. Abraham Lincoln Day and President's Day and Columbus Day? Crazy. <laughs> Public education is designed to do three things for black males in particular. Teach them to hate themselves. Teach them to love white culture. And number three, if possible, to effeminize or homosexualize them by the time he graduates. Tell him, tell him. So he does not pose a threat to the American social order. Now people would say, that's kind of deep. You say that the schools teach our children to hate? If I don't teach you anything positive about yourself, I am teaching you to hate yourself. And if I only give you positive information about me, I'm teaching you to love me. And if I learn as a boy in school that my teacher wants me to act a certain way in order to be successful, then you're conditioning me to be effeminate. Not necessarily homosexual. Because being effeminate and being a homosexual are, are two different things. I work in the prisons. A lot of brothers in the prisons are totally masculine, but they can be gay. A brother can be very effeminate and can be heterosexual. They tend to go together, but they don't have to. So my point is, good sister, no one should be guilty for the education that they receive. They should only be guilty for how they use it. Mm. That's the only thing we should be guilty of. Who district budget is public information. Okay. So you can get it. It should be on the website. Mm -hmm. If it's not, you can definitely call the superintendent office Correct. or what do they call the chief financial officer for the school district? Like the controller's office would have it. Okay. Uh, chair the local school board office would have it. You can also get it from the state. The state Department of Education can also provide you with that. It's public information. They do like to try to keep it from you. There's two budgets. There's block and then there's line item. You want line item. Let me give you the difference. Block budget might have five numbers. Teachers, after school programs, instruction. You follow me? Yeah. Up 35 billion. That ain't telling you nothing. Correct. You want to see how it's broken down. Correct. You want the line item. The now line sometimes they'll item. fight you on that, but it's your public right to have it. You the can line get it. item from the In state. fact, you know where you get it from? Your state rep or your state senator. Call the state rep's office or the state senator's office, and, and they'll have it. Okay. They'll send it right on to you. Sir, I'm trying to get the copy of the budget. And then once you get the budget, you get the parents together and organize a committee, financial committee, to investigate where the money's going, mm -hmm. special ed committee to see who's being put in special ed unnecessarily, okay. school discipline, look at who's being suspended and expelled, and then the fourth committee is school policy, changing the regulations of the district that disproportionately affect African-American children. That's when you talk about the institutional racism with the school policy committee. For example, let's say y'all want to change the policy. African immigrant children will not be referred for special education services until after they've had ESOL instruction to make sure they're proficient in English. All right. That's a policy piece that you want to put in place. And those are the things we need to put in place to protect our children. Okay? The top 1% children in the school are automatically going to be tested for mentally gifted. Because the white teachers don't think our kids are. So you got to make them test for mentally gifted. Another policy, if a four-year-old black child is ready for kindergarten, he can write his letter, his numbers, his sizes, his shapes, his colors. He knows his address. He knows his phone number. And you want your son to go to school in September. He only four, but he's working on the second grade level. School districts say, if you ain't six, by September 12th, or whatever date they use, you can't go. But you like, my son ready now. Why should he have to wait? Is there a state law saying he has to wait? No. It's only a local school district policy. That says he has to wait. And policies can be changed because they are not laws. Wow. They are only the operating procedures of the local district. And you have to do your research to see the difference between a policy and the law. If the state don't require it, then it's not a law. It's only a policy, and you can change that on the local level. We got to get organized. We are not organized. What did Kwame Ture Stokely Carmichael say? He said, if you organize a little, you get a little done. If you organize a lot, you get a lot done. If you organize some, you get something done. But if you don't organize at all, you don't get nothing done. And that's why we ain't got nowhere. We don't, everybody's organized. Look at the Hispanics. They got organizations out the kazoo. Look at the Asians. 
organizations out the kazoo. Look at the Jews, organizations out the kazoo. Look at the Arabs, organizations out the kazoo. And look at us. We don't have any race-based organizations. They'll have the Chinese American Association. We ain't got no African American Association. Or African American and African immigrant, just call it the African Association. Okay, we ain't got that. We need programs that look out for us as who we are. We get so subdivided, fraternities, the churches, the this, the that, and all that's necessary and good, but who's looking out for the overall? Who's looking out for all of us? We ain't got that. Everybody else got that in need. Schools is because if you're trying to change the color of America's teaching core, which is 93% white, they're not going to have that. Because public education is the way that the white women pay some bills. And they're pushing this out too with this whole um, Teach for America. Yes. So the black educators that are now teachers, they have them fired and they push. In fact, they did that in Washington, D.C. Yeah. That commission note came yep. in. She yep. pushed all the black and educators out. Yep. And, it and brought in the Teach for America. Exactly. And do y'all know what that is? In America, we have emergency teacher certification programs. Yes. Stay with me. Yes. Brooklyn has 500 teacher vacancies. I'm in charge of Teach for America. So I'm going to go around and find a bunch of white people with bachelor's degrees who are not certified to teach, but they have a bachelor's degree. And I'm going to bring them into the Brooklyn schools and give them emergency cert. Emergency cert to teach in the school. But then you got all y'all. Y'all got certifications. Y'all black. Y'all want to work in y'all hood, right? They said we can't do that because we have a contract with Teach for America for 200 spots. And y'all saying, but we certified. We, we certified. I got a teacher cert. They say it don't matter. We have a contract with Teach for America. And so guess what? Instead of the job going to the most qualified black, it go to an unqualified white. This is happening all across America. Y'all see them young kids coming in there, no certification, wanting to help the young blacks in the ghetto, okay, getting their loans paid off in the process. Yes, it's a racket. Public education is a racket. And that's why we got to build our own schools because you ain't going to get them to change the color of America's teaching code. Okay? And we got to understand that. And that don't mean every white woman don't want to teach the black because I see you. Oh my God. <laughs> no, we're not saying that. Okay? But we're just saying that our, our children need to be taught by our own. You understand that. Okay? So, why did you bring me here? <laughs> so, I, I got one. Oh, you put him! <laughs> you look at the prisons, I don't know if y'all heard, but the American Civil Liberties Union, and they don't really care about our people, they're just looking to get paid. But they file lawsuits in like nearly every state because the prisons are so crowded that they're putting four to six inmates in a room that was only in one cell that was only meant for maybe one or two. That's how crowded it is. And you know those little mats you used to flip on in gym class, the little blue mats? They got the inmates sleeping on them because there ain't nowhere else to put them. So this is how bad the arrest thing is. I mean, they're literally removing blacks out of the society. It's almost like a trash can just coming through and just collecting us up and, 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 and skating us away. And when you look at the crimes that we're getting arrested for, y'all, it's stuff. When I go to print, I mean, there's people in there for simple robbery. I don't mean weapon. I mean, I stole a roll of tissue. And I got six months to a year for a roll of tissue. I mean, they giving people maximum sentences for dumb stuff. You know what I mean? I was jaywalking. You know what I mean? Now, I didn't catch a jaywalker yet. You know what I mean? But I'm catching a lot of people being incarcerated for petty theft. Petty theft. I just met a sister yesterday, y'all. No lie. I met a sister yesterday. She stole a cell phone. She shouldn't have done it. She stole a cell phone from out of a supermarket. It wasn't for sale. It was the cashier's phone. So she stole <laughs> She was gangster though. She was gangster. She took the cell phone. The cops came. I thought they were just trying to get it back, but he still. Right. You know what she got? They gave her. What she had to pay? A twenty-five hundred dollar fine, or something like that. But she didn't have the money, right? So because she didn't pay the fine, she ended up getting locked up. Something like six months for not being able to pay the fine. In other words, they charge you a fine. They know you can't pay in thirty days. Y'all feel me? 
So that's going to give you prison time. We ain't even talking about selling drugs and killing people. We're talking dumb stuff, getting people locked up. So I mean, it, like you said, it's a crisis, and we got to move on. But let me say this before I come to the sister back there. It's not only that we don't want to get organized. There's gatekeepers in our community yes, whose job is to keep us disorganized. Thank you. Yeah. Are y'all following me? So for example, if I'm a gatekeeper, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come to a meeting like this, and I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to talk about how we don't really need to organize. I'm going to come up with a million and one reasons why we shouldn't do it now. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Not what my brother is saying here, because he said he want to get with me. He ain't a gatekeeper. But you know, you get them bourgeois blacks who come in there and sow division. We don't need this. I got something better for you. Leave them people alone. They don't know what they're talking about. So we also got to look at them, because they have a lot to do with why we don't get organized, because they explain away the need to organize. My ancestors came to America in 1701. Black man by the name of Bell. Most likely stolen from Igbo land in Nigeria. He had married, excuse me, he married a woman by the name of Selah. My great, 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 great grandmother. They had a daughter by the name of Jenny in 1745. 1774, she had a daughter by the name of Betsy Bell. Betsy married a free black man by the name of Isaac. They had about 13 children. One was named Harriet. Harriet was raped by the slave master who owned my family in Southampton County, excuse me, in Tava County, Maryland. His name was Aaron Anthony. She had Harriet was raped by Aaron Anthony. She gave birth in February of 1818 to Frederick Augustus Washington Bell. The very next year, her younger sister, young Betsy, was raped by the same slave master, giving birth to Frederick's brother, Stephen Henry Bell, my great, 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 great grandfather. When the Civil War kicked off, Frederick Douglass sent his two sons, Lewis and Charles. They fought in the 54th Massachusetts Colored Regiment, from which we get the movie Glory. My grandfather, Stephen, and his son, George, First black public school teacher in Tyler County, Maryland, was my great, great, great grandfather. They fought in the 7th Regiment U.S. Colored Troops of Maryland. After the Civil War, George Bailey married Annie Wayman. They had a daughter named Caroline. Caroline relocated to Philadelphia to live with her older sister. She had a daughter named Vivian. Vivian had a daughter named Ida, my grandmother, who had a son, Jamal, who had me. August the 21st, 1974, anniversary of the Haitian Revolution anniversary of the Nat Turner insurrection, mm. and the anniversary of the George Jackson assassination. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the favor of freedom and yet depreciate agitation are like men who want crops without pulling up the ground. They want rain, but they can't stand the thunder or the lightning. They want the ocean, but can't deal with the awful roll of its waters. He said the struggle we have might be moral, or it might be physical, or it might be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. He said, for 20 years I prayed on my knees to God to give me freedom from slavery, but the God didn't give me freedom until I got up off my knees and prayed with my feet. He said the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the people who they oppress. We determine how far and how poorly our enemies treat us. But he said, you remember this, power can seize nothing without a demand, black people. Power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. I thank you for having me. Calvary, first night.